Well, good morning. My name is Garland Robertson. I'm one of the pastors here at the local church, and uh, I am not Dan Sutherland. Some of you have figured that out, right? As soon as I walked out, he's much better looking than I am, but uh, good, no amens. That's good, thank you. <laughs> uh, Dan was supposed to be with us today, but he has laryngitis, he has an infection, and uh, he has been informed that he doesn't need to speak for three or four days. Here. That's where Dan is. I'm cutting in and out. Let me adjust this, all right? But uh, anyway, as we get started today, I, I want to lead us in another word of prayer. And uh, many reasons for that. I mean, prayer is good, right? You agree with that? Okay, yes, <laughs> okay. But, um, you know, I think a lot of us are going through a lot right now. And um, I think when that happens, it's time to pray. And uh, I know personally in our family, we've had two friends that have passed away this week due to COVID. Uh, we have two other friends who have been taken to the hospital this week with COVID. And uh, I'm going to ask you to pray for one young man. His name is Brian. And uh, Brian's a great young man, lives in our community. And Brian has many needs in his life, but now he has COVID on top of that. And uh, he's in the hospital right now on full oxygen. So I would ask that you pray for him, pray for his family. They can't be with him, and uh, that's tough for them right now. And uh, many of you are in the same situation. You have friends or family members who are going through this or who have. Maybe you've even lost some friends or family. And if that's true, would you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, a bunch, most of us. And uh, so... <clears throat> We just want to lift that in prayer today. And uh, what I want to do is I want to start by reading a prayer. I normally don't do this, but I think this is very appropriate today. And I'm going to read this prayer, and then I'm going to lead us in a prayer, okay? And uh, here's the prayer. This is a prayer that was very appropriate when it was prayed, and I think it's appropriate for today as well. And uh, it's actually a prayer from Martin Luther King Jr. It says, God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts souls and mind and love our neighbors as we love ourselves, even our enemy neighbors. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of this world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us in our going out and our coming in and our rising up and our lying down in our moments of joy and our moments of sorrow until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. It's a great prayer, isn't it? And I look forward to that day. But I'm going to ask if you would join me in prayer again now, okay? Fathers, we come to you, Lord. Uh, we come to you, some of us, with heavy hearts because people we love and care about are suffering right now. And so, Father, we lift those folks to you, Lord. I lift Brian to you. Lord, I pray for healing in his life. I pray for a miracle. I pray for his mom, his sister, the rest of their family. As, Lord, they are concerned as they're praying, we join them and lift him to you in prayer today. Lord, I think of others that we know that are in the same situation. So many of us have raised our hand today to say that that's the same thing going on in our lives. We know people who need you. Lord, I pray for those that we have lost. I pray for their families that you'd comfort them and give them peace during a time like this. Lord, I pray they'd turn to you, that they would know you. Lord, we lift our friend Dan to you. I pray for healing in his throat and uh, that you'd just watch over him. Father, we lift our country to you right now. In such a chaotic time. And Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for hope. And Lord, we know those things are found in you. So we pray that this nation would turn to you, Father. Let us be an example of that. So Lord, we lay these things before you and we cry out to you because you're our Father. You love us. We love you. And we're grateful that we can do that. Lord, help our hearts and minds to be open to what you have for us today. We give this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us, and thank you for joining me in that prayer time, and um, just glad you're here. Well, um, I'm kind of excited I get to teach today, and I'll be honest with you, I even worked with Dan a little bit on this message, and because uh, I only had about a day and a half to prepare, and uh, spent most of the day trying to get things where they need to be, and, uh, but I'm excited now. So t the title for today's message or teaching is Leftover Fast Food Versus Feasting with Jesus. And um, 
There's a big difference there. We're going to talk about that, all right? But I want to encourage you to take notes today. You can do that on your phone with the app. Um, if you just got some paper and a pen, I'd encourage you to do that. If God just nudges you with something, write it down and, and look at it later. That's always a help. And you can use your phone, your iPad, whatever you have, but we encourage you to take notes. And today I want to share three stories with you. There'll be some other things, of course, but I want to, I want to share three key stories, all right? Here's the first story. Many years ago, uh, when Dan Sutherland and I were actually pastors at another church, it was called Flamingo Road, we, we had another pastor that was on staff with us. And I'm not going to say his name, but he sang, he led worship, and uh, he had three daughters and a wife, of course, okay? And uh, I wouldn't dare mention Alan's, I'm, whoop, I messed up, all right? But anyway, don't tell him I told this story, but we do laugh about this. But um, at the same time, it was like all three of us, Dan and Alan and I, we got vans, minivans for our families. You know, that was kind of the SUV thing back in those days, all right? How many of you ever had a minivan? All right, anybody got one now? Oh, bless you, all right? Good for you, all right? You're probably the person that gets to drive when there's a lot of people, all right? <laughs> but every once in a while, when we would go out to lunch or go somewhere, you know, we'd kind of take turns driving, and, and we'd go in, in my friend's van every once in a while. And one of the fun things about getting in his van, well, kind of fun, was we would always find fast food leftovers in his van, always. And uh, it was like if you sat in the second seat, you'd find a few, but if you sat in the back seat, you'd find a lot. And uh, to be honest with you, there were times whenever you'd look back there and there was like this kind of uh, soggy, wet, moldy, half-eaten Happy Meal that was shoved down in the seat. And uh, it actually became somewhat of a game for us because every time we'd get in his van, we would start looking for food in the seats or under them. You know, and whoever found the most kind of won a prize. You know, they got to eat the left. No, we wouldn't do that, all right? That's kind of disgusting, isn't it? But French fries, maybe a frosty cup that had leaked out all over the floor. And you know, it happens when you got kids, right? And for those of us that have had children, we understand that. And, and you know what? I can handle a lot of things. I mean, if someone gets injured and they break a bone or they're bleeding or anything, I can jump in and help with that. But there's three key things I can't handle. Throw up, dirty diapers, and wet trash, okay? And that soggy fast food leftover with mold on it falls in the category of wet trash for me. And uh, it's just one of those things I don't do. I walk away or even run if I have to because otherwise I'm going to become part of the problem, you know? And some of you know what I mean already, okay? But... Um, Old, soggy leftovers fall into that category of wet trash, and it's not something we like or enjoy, right? We're in week three of our series that's entitled Living on Leftovers. And uh, each week we are using a different leftover meal as, as kind of a symbol of truth about stewardship. And, and when we talk about stewardship, stewardship is a biblical word, and it's really not that common in our language today. So I want to give some definition to it if we can. So I'm going to share a few statements about stewardship. Here's the first thing. Write this down in your notes if you would. Stewardship is the biblical word for management. It's the biblical word for management. It's, it's a simple definition, and any dictionary definition of stewardship is going to include management in it. And uh, here's a definition from our friend Dan Sutherland that I got. I stole from him. It says, stewardship is managing the gifts God has given us in such a way that we advance the kingdom, that's the agenda of God, and honor the king, that's the person of God. All right, let me read it again. Stewardship is managing the gifts God has given us in such a way that we advance the kingdom and honor the king. That's what stewardship is for us as believers. And, and if you look in the Bible to what a steward was, a steward was kind of a manager of an estate. He ran things for the master, the owner. He was trusted and he represented the owner. He ran and managed the estate for him. Now, when I was growing up, one of my first jobs I got, I was about 15 years old, and one of the first jobs that I got was at a place called the Red Eye Diner. Oh yeah, fine eating establishment, the Red Eye Diner. Not really, okay? And, and my job was at night, whenever they would close, I would go in and I would clean the place up. At least I would attempt to. It was not a very clean place. And uh, to be honest with you, I really did not enjoy that job. 
And, you know, as time went on and I worked there for a few weeks, um, I was not a good steward for the owner of the Red Eye Diner. And, and because of that, the owner at one point let me know that I was not a good steward and actually relieved me of my stewardship duties. Um, in other words, let's not talk biblical, let's just be practical. I got fired, okay? I got fired by the owner of the Red Eye Diner. And, and I gotta tell you, I, I remember I walked out and once I got out and I closed the door, I went, yes, thank you, God. All right, I was, that was one of the greatest days in my life to get relieved of my duties at the Red Eye Diner. And uh, the Red Eye Diner was not a great place to work. They had wet trash. Enough said right there, okay? And, and you just can't handle it. It gets you every time. So that was one of my first stories of trying to attempt at stewardship. I was not a good steward at that place. Here's another thought about stewardship. Stewardship is the biblical concept of managing an estate for the owner. And, and running our lives in such a way that our master Jesus himself is honored and pleased. That's what it is for those of us that claim to be believers. We are managing this estate, this life that God has given us for Jesus himself, and we want to honor and please him. And don't miss this. Stewardship is not managing what you own. Stewardship is managing an estate for the owner. And in this case, that's Jesus. Here's another thing. Stewardship is managing the grace of God in our lives. And thank God for grace. You know, this is week three of our series, Living on Leftovers. And, and you may remember that at the end of last week's message, there was kind of a teaser or a descriptive for this week. And it said this, it said, the greatest way to steward all that we have is by giving the most attention to the greatest things we have, our relationship with Jesus. All right, I want to say that again, but let's put that on the screen this time and write this down in your notes. The greatest way to steward all that we have is by giving the most attention to the greatest thing we have, our relationship with Jesus. We've been given many blessings to steward in our lives, right? I mean, think about the gifts that you've been given, okay? I mean, God has given us time. Very important thing, and we're going to talk more about that in a few moments. He's given us gifts, okay? Spiritual gifts that we can use to glorify him. We have talents that he's given to us, things that some of us are born with, or maybe we learned along the way. He's given us finances that he wants us to steward well. All of these things, but the greatest thing that he's given us to steward is him. It's Jesus and what we do with that. So that's why it's so important. And that's why we're talking about leftover fast food versus feasting with Jesus. Because here's the premise of what we're looking at. Most of us are settling for leftover fast food rather than dining with Jesus. And let me explain that a little bit. Because we're living on scraps instead of fast or feasting with the king. And, and we're living way beneath what God intended for us. Because God has a purpose and he intends great things. Let me share another story with you, all right? Here's story number two, and I like this story. I grew up in a place called Easley, South Carolina, and um, Easley is a beautiful community, and it sits at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's just a beautiful area there, and it's right in the middle of Greenville, South Carolina, and Clemson, South Carolina. Some of you have heard of Clemson University, okay, the Clemson Tigers, and uh, we actually had tiger paws painted on the streets in our town headed towards Clemson because People love the Clemson Tigers up there. They're my second favorite team. This is first, all right? Yes, for those that have, no, okay, we'll just go on, all right? Bless you, all right? But um, it was a great place to grow up. And, and my dad was a pastor, so every Sunday morning, of course, we would be at church. And uh, we'd be there for Sunday school, we'd be there for church. But one of the things that I looked forward to was when church was over, we would go to my granny Day's house for lunch. And uh, when you went to Granny Day's house on a Sunday for lunch, it wasn't just lunch, it was a feast. I mean, it was an incredible meal. And, and, and we'd have things like roast beef or maybe fried chicken or a baked ham. There would always be mashed potatoes. I mean, homemade mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade mac and cheese, green beans, corns, cantaloupe, or whatever else was fresh from the garden. There'd be hot biscuits or cornbread, and uh, we'd have pickled beets or peaches or whatever else my grandmother had canned. 
And of course, dessert, banana pudding, or maybe devil's food cake, or maybe a fresh hot pie. Some of you right now are ready to leave and go to lunch, aren't you? Well, if you can find a place like my grainy days, I'll go with you, all right? But uh, it was just, it was amazing. And I mean, we looked forward to that. It was a feast. And the family would gather around, and my granny, she'd work on Saturday and Saturday night and early Sunday morning to make sure food was ready. And uh, it was just always an amazing feast. But one of the best parts was coming back to her house after Sunday night church. Okay, we had Sunday night church back then. Okay, wow. Okay, anyway, we'll just move on, all right? (laughs) But we would go to Granny and Papa Day's house again after Sunday night church, and we'd have leftovers, and we'd watch Bonanza. I mean, what more could you want out of life, you know? One of the best Westerns ever on TV was Bonanza with those Cartwright boys. I loved Hoss, you know, one of my favorite. We got a guy on our staff, his name is Hoss. How about that? And I like him just because his name's Hoss. But um, that was such a treat for us, and it was such an incredible time. And here's what we learned. We learned that eating was an act of worship, especially at Granny Day's house. I mean, it was, we would pray for that meal, but I mean, it was just a feast. And so I want to take you to another story now that's more important than any of the others, and that's feasting with Jesus. Now, Jesus offers us a daily feast, and it's described in one of my favorite passages in the scripture, Psalm chapter 23. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to look at the screen, and I want us to read Psalm 23 together, okay? Most of us are familiar with this, but let's go ahead and let's read this out loud together, all right? Join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Such a beautiful passage of scripture. And uh, there's so much to learn. But Psalm 23 describes what it's like to feast with God every day. And David lays this out in such a beautiful way. Not to live on leftover fast food, but to feast with the king every day. So let's look at the, let's look at the feast, all right? This is an all you can eat from this menu, all right? And here's the first thing. First thing is rest. Look at that verse. It says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. It's rest. We lie down and we rest when we're with him. You know, as a kid, I can remember when I would be in school and uh, we would have to, there was a certain time during the day, we would have to put our heads down on our desk for about 15 minutes or so and have a rest time. All right, anybody else ever do that? All right, we'd have this rest time. Here's the truth, no one ever rested. Okay, we never went to sleep. My friend Jimmy would be on the other side of the room making, you know, crude noises with his body, his armpit or something like that. And we'd all be snickering and laughing and, you know, it just, it was kind of crazy. But it wasn't a rest time, you know. And, and so that was just such an important part of our day. I don't know really why. But anyway, I wish someone would make me rest now though, don't you? I mean, and, and to be honest, I wish I could rest <laughs> Because a lot of times we can't. And as a kid, during that rest time, I would be thinking about maybe playing football or working on our treehouse in the woods when we get home or maybe just daydreaming about things. But now where I am in life, the thoughts that run through my mind are about work. They're about family. They're about friends, relationships, health, finances, COVID, our country where it is. And, And when you think about all those things, the reality, we need rest, don't we? We need rest. And for some of us, lately has been a struggle, even with rest. And I know people who struggle even sleeping at night, and and it's not comfortable. But it's one of the things that's on the menu with the feast with God is rest. And he wants to give us rest. He makes us lay down in green pastures. The best place to find true rest is feasting with our shepherd, Jesus. The next thing we see on the menu is restoration. Restoration, I love this. He restores my soul. Now, I don't know about you, but 2020 was a different kind of year, wasn't it? 
And I mean, we all talk about that. I don't know what it did to you, but I know what it did to me. And uh, it made me tired. To be honest with you, it wore me out at times. My soul was tired, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, and at times even spiritually exhausted, if I'm honest. And, and there's still times where I feel a little worn out and tired. And, and it's just from the things that are going on around us and to the people around us that we love and care about. David cried out in Psalm chapter 51, verse 12, at one point, he said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And he cried out to God, and David had been involved in sin and it messed up and just felt lost and worn out and weary. And what does he do? He cries out to the Father and he says, restore me. And here's the beautiful part. When we feast with Jesus, he brings restoration. You see, he offers us rest at his feast. He offers us restoration. But then he offers us this as well, and I love this one, direction. He offers us direction. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me to the paths of righteousness. All right? I want you to look at the person next to you and just say this. He leads me. Do that right now. And he will lead you if you let him. There's this crazy thing about God that I'll never understand. It even sounds weird saying that. But you know what? God lets us make choices. That's amazing to me. If I was God, I would maybe do that with a few people. But a lot of people, I'd just want to control them, you know? Yeah, you're laughing because you feel the same way, you sinner. All right? But that's why we need God, right? God allows us to make choices. And, and sometimes the direction we choose, not good. Pop. There we go, all right? But he wants to give us direction. And that's part of this menu. It's part of the feast. He leads me to still waters. He leads me to paths of righteousness. Is there anything more exhausting and frustrating than not being able to make a decision? I mean, it's tough sometimes, right? I mean, you have things going on in your life and you've got to make a major decision and sometimes we'll call other people, we'll call on them, we'll pray, we'll seek these things out. And, and sometimes it's just very exhausting to have to make a decision or to take a certain direction. And, and to be honest, some of us, we even struggle at fast food drive throughs right? I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, the menu hasn't changed. They still have a Big Mac, all right? And they still have fries. And we get up there and we're like, oh, oh, give me a minute, oh. And, uh, or people in your car do that. I'll just leave that right there, Okay. But not having clear direction is exhausting. And it wears you out. You want to find the right path? You want to do the right thing? Listen to this. When Jesus is directing, we're going in the right way. We're going in the right way. And he gives us direction at this feast that we can have with him. Direction. The next thing is peace and courage. Peace and courage. I love this verse. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what can be more scary than that? It says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Peace in the valley of death. Courage in the face of fear. This is one of my favorite passages to use whenever I'm doing a, a memorial service or a celebration of someone's life or a funeral. And the reason why is because especially if that person had a relationship with Jesus Christ, then they're like David. David. They didn't have to fear death. I don't fear death today. I'm not afraid to die because I know what's waiting for me. And we'll even talk more about that in a few moments in this last verse. But because of that, we don't have to fear death. There's things I do fear. I fear pain. I, I fear discomfort somewhat, those kind of things. But we don't even have to be afraid of that. When we have a relationship with Jesus, we don't have to fear death or anything. He gives us peace and comfort and courage. He gives us peace in the midst of a pandemic. Think about that. He gives us comfort in a chaotic world. He gives us courage in the face of uncertainty. And on his menu for our feast is peace and courage. And then he also gives us this. He gives us abundance. He gives us abundance. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. 
all right? Yesterday, I was finishing the pot of coffee at the house, and I was filling it in a cup, and I thought, I'll just pour it all in, and I wasn't paying attention. It just ran over, went everywhere. Now, that was a mess, and I had to clean it up. But whenever our cup runs over with him, it's blessings. It goes beyond what our needs are. And that's what he does. There's abundance there. And one of the problems with leftover fast food is that it's never quite enough. It doesn't fill you up. And that's if you're daring enough or courageous enough to eat it, right? When I was in college, we got an apartment. When I say we, there was four other guys and I, five of us. Five college guys that played ball together in the same apartment. I'm a bit of a clean freak, so I just closed the door to my room and I'd wade through the mess. But every once in a while, you'd go in the kitchen, there'd be an old pizza box. And you'd open it and there'd be a slice of pizza left over from the day before. And you'd eat it, right? (laughs) And God only knows what bacterial infection we got (laughs) or whatever was going on. But it was never really enough. And that's the way it is with the fast food, right? It's never enough. It doesn't fill you up. Our Father prepares a feast for us like Granny Day's Sunday lunch. Now, I know his feast is perfect, but here's what I mean. You will walk away filled up. You'll walk away full. And here's the beautiful part. There will be leftovers that you can use whenever you need to. And that's what he prepares for us, and he does it in abundance. And then the next thing that he has at this feast is goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I love how Psalm 23 kind of wraps up. And this is the first part of the last verse. And, and the dessert at this feast is awesome. It's goodness and mercy. Good things from God and mercy when you blow it. Think about that. We serve a God that wants to provide good things for us. And he does. The key to it is us following him. But this is something that I need and you do too. It's mercy. Mercy when we blow it. You know, we say often, this is the perfect place for imperfect people. And it is. And it starts with us, those of us that are up front. Because we're not perfect, but Jesus is. And there's mercy for us when we blow it. We just tell him. And there's mercy there for us. Goodness and mercy. What a menu. What a feast. Think about it. Here's the things we've talked about. Rest, restoration, direction, peace, courage, abundance, goodness, mercy. But there's one thing that's missing at this feast. I know that might catch us off guard. There's one thing that's missing, and here's what it is. Worries. Worries. There's no worries at this feast. Look at the last part of this verse. It says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Now, let's say that big, okay? How long? That's heaven. When this life is over, we get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's no worries. There's no pain, no discomfort, no no sorrow. There's no worries. And this comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what makes the difference. That's why in verse 4, David was able to say, I don't fear death. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he knew what was ahead for him. And the same thing is true for us who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not knowing about him, but it's knowing him personally. It's having an intimate relationship with him, making Jesus your shepherd, giving your life to him. No fear of death, no worries. So I have a question, why not now? Why would you not now want that relationship with him? I I wanna give us an opportunity to have that relationship. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never established that relationship with him, I wanna encourage you to do it right now. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And and I would just ask you to pray this prayer after me. Repeat it and pray it to God because you want that relationship with him. Can we close our eyes? Let's bow our heads for a moment. And, And if that's you and you've never done this before, I encourage you to do it now. And just cry out and just say, dear Jesus, I need you in my life. I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my shepherd. And so today I am giving my life to you. I mess up, I make mistakes, I'm a sinner, but I confess that and I give my life to you. Come into my heart now, be my savior. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand up, okay? God bless you guys, awesome, all right? Bless you. That's the greatest decision you will ever make, and, and we want you to let us know about it so that we can be an encouragement to you and help you in your walk with Christ. And that's it. You can let us know on the app or the cards in front of you, out at our connect table. We have a gift for you. But we want to be an encouragement to you, okay? No worries. No worries because we know him. Now, here's the great thing about this feast. When you know Jesus, you can feast with him every day. And here's the best part. The feast is open 24 hours a day. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can dine with Jesus nonstop. You ever been on a cruise before? Then you get it, okay? It's like anything you want, anytime you want it. So what's the problem? Well, here's the problem for some of us. A lot of Christ followers eat one meal a week and starve in between. And I think that's true for a lot of us. Most Christ followers eat one meal a week and starve in between. We show up on Sunday, we have a great meal. There's the appetizer of worship. The worship was great today. The main course of teaching, that's what we're doing now. And, and maybe even dessert is just hanging out with people that you've grown to love and you've met here. It's a great meal, but then we starve for a week, sometimes two, till we show up on a Sunday again, right? But there's this incredible and amazing buffet available every day of the week. But we eat one meal a week. Why do we do that? Well, I want to challenge you today as we kind of wrap this up. I want to challenge you to choose feasting with Jesus every day. Choose it every day. And, and don't live on leftovers from last Sunday all week long. But feast every day. So let me give you just some basic things that will help you with that, okay? Here you go. First of all, spend 15 minutes a day with Jesus. Just 15 minutes. Just start there. And do two things with that time. Read his book and listen to him speak. Just read his word. Read a passage of scripture and then just stop and listen to him to speak to you. And I want to give you some helps with that also. There's, there's plans for, for reading his book, the Bible, in this app that we use called uversion.com. Let's put that on the screen, okay? And if you'll look that up, you're gonna find this Bible app that is incredible. I use it every day. Our leadership team here at church, we use this every day together. We do readings together so that we can grow in our relationship with Christ. There's 41 different translations of the Bible, numerous different plans for reading scripture and thousands of devotionals that you can use. And we recommend this. This will be a help to you and a strength. But here's some plans for listening to God speak. After you've read his word, just sit for a few minutes and let Jesus speak to you. And it's not that difficult, but sometimes we just need to sit and be still so that we can hear. A lot of us, the reason we don't hear others is because we're talking, right? Sometimes you just got to be quiet. Now, our friend Dan Sutherland that we talked about, he actually wrote a book, and it's called Chair Time. And uh, you can find this book on Amazon.com. We're going to put that up as well. That's all you got to do is just pull up Amazon.com and poke that in there, and that book, will it'll load up, and you can download it today if you want to. But it's about sitting in a chair, talking to God, and asking him to speak to you. And that's it. You know, I shared three stories today in our teaching. First one was the leftover food story in my friend's caravan. The second one was Sunday lunch at Granny Day's house. And the third one was feasting with Jesus. The best part of the fast food in the van of my friend was the memories that we share. You see, when we get together, we still talk about that and we laugh about it. The best part of it was the friends. It's the relationship we have. The best part of feasting at Granny's Day house was Granny Day and our family being together. The food was great, but the best part was our family. And the best part of feasting with Jesus is being with him. It's being with Jesus. Now, I heard a story about a pastor who went to visit the four-year-old class at his church. And he went in and he asked the kids, said, do you have a favorite Bible verse? And one little boy jumped up and he said, I do, I do. The pastor said, man, that is great. What is it? He said, it's Psalms 23, verse 1. So the pastor looked at him. He said, well, what does it say? And the little boy said this. 
He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. I think he got it right. He's all I want. And when we can get to a place where Jesus is all I want, it'll affect every other relationship in our life. It'll affect everything else we go through, and we can feast with him.